by fishing through the use of regulations. And it was also uh, uh, geared towards um, improving the production of walleye in the fish hatcheries. Uh, so I've really what we've been doing uh, uh, this year has been somewhat hampered by COVID. Our creel surveys had to be suspended uh, because of face-to-face uh, -face contact that's necessary. People are out there trying to socially distance and we didn't want creel clerks uh, uh, getting in the way of people's ability to feel like they were in a safe environment while they were fishing. So we're not gonna get any creel survey information from walleye anglers or any other anglers this year because of concerns about uh, social distancing. We also were unable to uh, collect walleye eggs this year uh, because of COVID and we could not safely deploy our crews to collect those eggs. And during the beginning of the spawn, uh, all of our employees were put on two weeks of administrative leave. So we're gonna have uh, basically a very limited amount of walleye production this year. We're working to get walleye eggs from some other states. Uh, so we'll be raising some walleye fingerlings and we've stocked some fry already. Uh, we had a little, we had one or two days of egg collection and then the uh, shutdown came. So uh, it's gonna be a down year for production. The good news is when it comes to fish populations, missing year class isn't always the worst thing in the world. And we'll be hopefully geared up to really hit it hard next year and make up the difference. Uh, our walleye initiative right now is really moving ahead pretty well, especially when it comes to our capabilities to produce walleye. We've made a number of, Im of improvements to uh, walleye propagation that increases not only the numbers of walleye that we can uh, stock out each year, but also the size of walleye that we can stock. Um, we have recently moved to try to have our fingerling stockings reach at least 43 millimeters in length because recent research showed that fish 43 millimeters and longer, which is a, just under two inches, uh, are fully scaled and they handle the, the uh, they, they, they survive the process of being captured from the hatchery ponds and then being distributed and they survive better because they are fully scaled. And so we have, since the initiative started, we have been geared up to try to produce 43 millimeter fingerlings at, as, as the smallest size fish that we stock other than fry. In addition, we've been, uh, reviving our abilities to raise walleye on artificial diet. Milford Hatchery and Mead Hatchery have both been involved with the culture of walleye fingerlings on a pellet to diet. And once we train the walleye to take an artificial diet, then we can raise them to about any size we need. Uh, we are shooting for the, to be able to produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 nine inch fish a year uh, sometime within the next two years, we get all of the uh, improvements made to the facility that we have. Right now we have the capability to raise about 30,000 uh, nine inch fish a year. And those, uh, those are really valuable uh, in terms of stocking some lakes where we have a hard time with good survival on fry and fingerling. So uh, we have a new building that we want to build at Mead. Uh, it was approved by the, the legislature and the governor to build a new intensive walleye building at the Mead Hatchery that will be able to produce about 500,000 43 millimeter fingerlings and also be able to produce about 30,000 uh, nine inch uh, uh, walleye each year there. And then we're retrofitting the inside of the Milford Hatchery. We just acquired some new tanks um, that allow us to produce in the neighborhood somewhere between uh, uh, 50 and 70,000 more nine inch fish at the Milford Fish Hatchery. So we're, we're making a lot of, we're making some real great headway in addition to the actual improving the, the walleye production equipment and facilities. We've also uh, got a lot of our hatchery ponds up and running again. Um, we uh, have got all the ponds out at the meat hatchery fully functional for the first time in the history of that hatchery. So that's gonna add additional spot pond space to our walleye production, production efforts. And then also, uh, We've been without the Woodson Rearing Pond for the last few years due to a flood over there that occurred that damaged the uh, dam at Woodson State Fishing Lake. And so that was producing a large portion of our, of our channel catfish. And we had to move that channel catfish production to the other hatcheries. And so that took up some valuable space that we could have used for raising walleye fingerlings as well. That facility has been back open and operational again. So the ponds that we're temporarily using, we were using to raise channel catfish are gonna be returned to raising walleye and largemouth bass. So I think the, the, the future is pretty bright in terms of our propagation program. We continue to evaluate uh, what's going on with our link limits and, and, and the public acceptance and the response 
of the fish populations to these different link limit options. Uh, one of the options that we put in place was to create some trophy fisheries on the lakes with the 21 inch link limit. And it also gave us an opportunity to allow fish to reach a larger size that makes uh, it easier for us to obtain eggs by having better brood stock out there for egg production. So sure. I think that sort of wraps it up, but that two page sheet should be coming out uh, sometime in the next week. And I will make sure the Walleye Association gets a copy and we look forward to working with you guys on any and everything that you're interested in getting involved with. Okay, thanks Doug, I appreciate that. Um, is, is it possible for us to get a spot in that August 2020 agenda? so that we can have more people involved and cover the subject a little more deeply. I mean, personally, I'd like to see some of some of your data uh, that biologists are using to establish link limits. Um, you know, I'd like to know how you monitor uh, what size and what your classes are in specific lakes at specific times. You know, some of us have a very good handle on that. Some of us don't have a very good handle on that. But I know there's a lot of folks that are interested um, and looking at this year uh, not being able to, uh, because of the COVID, stock the majority of the lakes, from what I understand, and then also with the flood loss from last year, things are looking pretty rough right now. And I, for one, would like to either volunteer some time or get involved in any way, whether that would be a annual creel, creel survey uh, that I do from my boat. I think there are several people that would do that. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that we can help if we get involved, not just, not just the Kansas Walleye Association, but individuals that are willing to volunteer and help. I think there's a lot more people that are concerned than maybe what speak up. Um, I've been following uh, some Facebook groups recently. Uh, there's one called the Kansas Walleye Anglers. And there are folks on there that are, uh, you know, it's obvious that they care about the fisheries and they're very opinionated. But I don't think that a lot of the responses that I've seen are backed up by fact. Uh, not saying that what you are saying isn't happening. I'm saying that's an indication that the general public doesn't understand. Um, yeah, I might mention too that we, uh, all of our biologists create at least two newsletters each year for their part of the state. And any of them that have any walleye fisheries, you'll find a wonderful amount of information in those fisheries newsletters. And there are all of them are archived on our fisheries pages in on our website. So if you're not a if you haven't subscribed to those newsletters, you can download uh, as many of those as you can as you want to read, and you'll find a lot of good information in those new newsletters about the status of our walleye fisheries around the state. Yeah, no, I, th I think I've. I may not have read them all, but I believe I've read them all. Um, most of us have, but I think we're more interested specifically in what studies, what actual biological uh, guidance was used to develop the length limits. And, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody's pointing fingers or, or trying to say, hey, this is wrong. You know, I think we're looking at ways that we can work together to achieve a better fishery. I think that's what everybody wants in the that's, end. Uh, that, and that's Mr. why I'd Mr. like to to see this added to the August agenda so that we can all have a conversation yeah. about it and see how we can be helpful. Mr. Yeah. Hello, who, who was talking? Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Secretary Loveless. Yes. Is it okay if I comment? Oh yeah, sure, please. Hey, Justin, thanks for your uh, your thoughts and your passion. Um, and Doug, I appreciate your really comprehensive summary. What Doug didn't get to in his summary was, and I know he's well-versed on this too, is uh, a lot of the research that's been done. Some of it really close to you at Glen Elder, like you referenced, that was presented at a previous commission meeting uh, by Scott Waters, a really excellent biologist we have up in your neck of the woods. And so um, my background is fisheries and what I've been impressed with in my time at the agency is the depth of understanding and thought that's gone into their decision-making. But what I might suggest uh, Chairman Lauber is that we consider setting up a special meeting, right? That focuses on uh, these walleye issues and the walleye initiative 
And Justin, we could coordinate that with your folks. I don't know if you guys have an annual meeting or something like that. Um, we can certainly do it as part of the commission meeting, but to focus on one subject for you know an extended length of time might be better suited for a, a meeting dedicated just to that. And we'd be glad to do that. And the other thing I might mention, if, if you let Doug talk, he'll talk for another half hour on all the opportunities to get involved as volunteers because they have some great, great ones. And so that would be a great topic for that, that meeting that we could discuss with you. I appreciate uh, that. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that. I think uh, that, that would be even better than including it as a topic in the August meeting. If we could set a, a meeting aside from that and, and focus yeah. on the issue at hand, I think there's a lot of folks that would be interested in that, including yeah. myself. Good. Well, how, I would, how would we go about setting a date for that? Is there, uh, yeah. um, we, Mr. We can Loveless, would I com communicate with you or? Yeah, Brad, this is Brad Loveless, secretary again. We're, we're glad to work directly uh, with you, Justin. And if it's okay with you, chairman, we'll, we'll get uh, Justin's contact information, contact him tomorrow and start, you know, finding out details, needs, numbers of people, all that kind of stuff. And folks are, they'll, they'll, they'll impress you, Justin. I'm looking forward to listening into that meeting because uh, uh, it'll, your questions will be good. Your passion and your insight is, is really valuable to us. And Doug's folks are, are just as passionate. And so that'll be a good meeting. We'll look forward Very to good. that. I Very think good. Okay, Lovell. look forward to hearing you guys and thanks for your time. I think that'd be a good idea. So is there any other comments on this subject? Mr. Chairman, Mike Miller, Assistant Secretary and Pratt, I was just gonna point out that one of the reasons you haven't seen any results from the walleye telemetry study at Glen Elder is there's still another year left in that study, right, Doug? Yes. So that's one of the reasons you couldn't find that. Uh, Scott's still working on that. He's been tracking fish all spring. I think there's gonna be some really good information out of that, but when that is finally completed, then you'll see the, the results from that and it will be online on our, on our webpage. Great, okay, appreciate it. Okay, is there any other, Chairman Lauder, is there any other uh, public comment on non-agenda items? Okay, I want to go back. Are you there, Jason? Yep, I'm here. All right. Uh, some of you received an email from Colonel Ott showing some pictures, and uh, I was incorrect as to the property I was looking at relative to the coyote on display was not the property that is in the picture. The property in the picture, I'm not exactly sure where it is and whether or not there's a camper that may be gone now, but I will backtrack in that it certainly appears like the coyote was visible from the nursing home. Now, having said that, I'm not sure I would have issued that ticket and I'm not sure I feel any different about uh, the need to continue that, that law, but I do want to point out that Colonel Ott was right and I was wrong as to the visibility. I don't know if anybody else has any comments or not. Okay, well, let's move into the public hearing. KAR 115 20, 2520 Sand Hill Cranes. Yep, this is Rich Holtest and Office. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, I just have a few slides that I want to summarize what the proposed changes are to this regulation. We spent a pretty significant amount of time talking about this in the workshop session at the last meeting. Uh, so the summary this evening will be much more brief um, and just summarize what the proposal is. Uh, the first slide you see here tonight is what our overall uh, Sandhill Crane hunting unit is in the season structure, which is the Wednesday after the first Saturday in November and continuing for 58 days, including that opening day. Jason, if you can do the next slide, please. Okay, so just a quick summary of what took me quite a bit of time to, to um, put together for the last meeting. Um, overall, the current season structure does not align well with Sandhill Crane migration. In fact, in most seasons, uh, the peak of Sandhill Crane abundance has actually already occurred prior to when the season opens. And 
the primary consideration and reasoning for that is um, avoiding conflicts with uh, whooping cranes that are present in the state at that time. Um, one thing that is beneficial and, and what this change relates to is whooping crane migration occurs along a very predictable corridor that, that runs through the central part of Kansas. Next slide, please. So just a summary of what the proposed changes are in the item that's in your uh, public hearing uh, briefing book there. That's revised changes uh, to revise 115-2520 to split our current Sandhill Crane hunting unit into two zones, a western and central zone, and then adjust the uh, season dates for that western zone uh, where whooping crane use is quite limited uh, to better align with uh, Sandhill Crane migration. And I have one more slide, please, Jason. And this is a reflection of what that proposal is. You can see the, the boundary between the west and central there primarily runs along um, Highway 183. It does jog to the west there, uh, south of Webster, um, over to 283 and goes north from there. But the season dates that are in the proposal are third Saturday in October, continuing 58 days. And the season dates in the central um, would remain the same Wednesday after the first Saturday in November and continue for 58 days. Um, and that's the summary I have for you. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Commissioner Lauber, does anybody have any questions for Rich? Well, this is something we're going to have to vote on. And uh, I guess my two cents worth is that it has opportunity for the sportsman and doesn't have a particular downside. And I would like to have somebody move that we approve this regulation. This is Commissioner Spore, I move. Commissioner Hazlett, I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded that we approve 115 25 20 as presented. Is there any questions from? or any comments and discussion from the audience, from the public, from the commission? <laughs> Chairman Lauber here, hearing none. Sheila, you wanna call the roll? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Aye. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Phil? Yes. Commissioner Sporer? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Okay. Uh, the next item is 2021 waterfowl seasons. Um, Tom, ready to go? Jason needs to unmute. Yeah, Tom. just a second. I was getting this PowerPoint ready. While okay. I was there. Can okay. you hear me now? Fine. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, and viewing public. Um, I have a short presentation on the 2021, 2000, or 2020, 2021 waterfall seasons. Almost there. There we go. Next slide, please. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service annually develops frameworks from which states are able to establish migratory game birds hunting seasons. These frameworks establish maximum bag and possession limits, season lengths, their latest closing dates, States must operate within these frameworks when establishing state-specific migratory game bird hunting seasons. States can be more restrictive, but cannot be more liberal. Notable framework changes from previous year, including reduction of the daily bag limit from, from two to one. The closing date for general duck season is January 31st, where previously it was the Sunday of January. And states may designate two additional hunting days for veterans and active military. Uh, federal frameworks and background materials were provided in the briefing item. Next slide, please. Do you need 
initiate the regulation process for Kansas waterfowl seasons. Six public meetings were held the first part of August across the state. Cities were chosen by the combination of geographic location and potential number of hunters that could be reached. Meetings were well attended and the feedback for current season structures were positive. In the fall of 2019, KGWPT conducted a large scale waterfowl hunter survey. 13,500 Kansas residents who were born after 2003 and purchased a Kansas waterfowl stamp in the last six seasons were surveyed. Response rates were similar to Kansas 2015 waterfowl hunter survey and yielded a statistical adequate sample to garner attitudes from Kansas residents waterfowl hunters on a statewide basis. Caution should be made when making zones or regional inferences. Survey summary were sent to commissioners and are also posted on KDEWP page. The next few slides will highlight some of these survey results. Next slide, please. There are a variety of factors that play a role in determining season timing preferences. These factors can vary from hunters to hunters depending on where they hunt, how they hunt, what they hunt, as well as a variety of other factors. The opportunity to hunt with the greatest number of ducks of presence consistently rates high among these preferences. This leads to the importance of overlaying seasons with peak migration as well as timing seasons with high harvest periods. Next slide, please. The majority of respondents indicated that they were satisfied with the current season timing and the current season structure was just right. For the high plains unit, the early zone and the late zone, there are more who select the seasons were too early than too late. Compared to the southeast zone, where more selected the seasons were too late rather than too early. There is very little differences in satisfaction with combined responses than those who just hunted in a particular zone. Next slide, please. For the high plains unit, the late zone, and the southeast zone, December hunting days were selected as the most important. November days were deemed the most important for the early zone. Next slide, please. Satisfaction with current goose seasons were high with nearly three quarters of the respondents selecting that the seasons were just right. The 107 day hunting frameworks, the maximum allowed by the Mike Bird Treaty Act, allows for plentiful goose hunting opportunities and to overlap the seasons to cover most of the goose migration in Kansas. Next slide, please. KDWP has received inquiries from some snow goose hunters to advance the opening day of spring light goose conservation order. This would require closing the regular light goose, Canada goose, and white fronted goose seasons earlier in their frameworks. To provide hunter feedback in this matter, the survey queued hunters if they would favor closing regular goose seasons earlier to allow the spring conservation season to open up earlier. Results indicated that only a small portion would favor this change. Next slide, please. The federal framework daily frameworks allows for a daily bag limit for Canada geese was increased from three to eight in 2013. Since 2013, Kansas has selected a six Canada goose daily bag limit. Similar to past surveys, respondents preferred a daily bag limit of six Canada geese. Next slide, please. Late in the regulation cycle last year, Congress passed the John D. Dingle Jr. Conservation Management and Recreational Act. A component of this act allows the two additional hunting days for veterans and active military, similar to youth waterfall hunting days. Survey results, as indicated by the top graph, there is support to allow two additional hunting days for the military. The bottom graph indicates that the preferred timing of those additional days is to hold in conjunction with youth waterfowl hunting days, which is historically one week prior to the general duck season opener in each duck zone. Next slide, please. After considerable discussion and review of migration, harvest, hunter activity, and other factors, staff recommendations are an attempt to best align season dates that allow the greatest opportunity for participation and hunt harvest for all Kansas waterfowl hunters. Next slide, please. For September till, staff recommends to adopt a nine-day season in the High Plains unit and a 16-day season in the Low Plains zones. To adopt federal frameworks for daily bag limit, possession limit, shooting hour, Staff recommends the following season dates for the High Plains of September 19th to September 27th, and for the Low Plains zones, September 12th to September 27th. Next slide, please. For youth, veteran, and active military days, staff recommends to adopt two youth waterfowl hunting days and two days for veterans and active military waterfowl hunting days, to adopt federal frameworks for daily bag limit, possession limit, and shooting hours. Staff recommends youth, veteran, and active military waterfowl hunting days to be held simultaneously 
and held one week prior to the opening day of the general duck season in each of the respective duck zones. Next slide, please. For general duck season, staff recommends adopting a 96 day in the high plains unit and a 74 day season in the low plains zones. To adopt federal frameworks for the daily bag limit, possession limit, and shooting hours, and select option A for the merganser limit. Staff recommends the following season dates for the high plains zone, October 10th to January 3rd, and January 22nd to January 31st, in the early zones from October 10th to December 6th, and then from December 19th to January 3rd, and for the late zone to begin on October 31st and run through January 3rd, and then run from 23rd of January to January 31st, and for the Southeast zone to be from starting November 7th and run through January 3rd, and then resuming running from January 16th to January 31st. Next slide, please. For goose sta seasons, staff recommends to adopt a 105 day season for dark geese. This would include Canada geese and any dark goose species except white fronted geese and light geese and to select option B, which is 88 days with a season bag limit of eight, uh, daily bag limit of two for white fronted geese. Staff recommends to adopt federal frameworks for daily bag limit, possession limits for light geese and white fronted geese and just the bag limit for six dark geese. Staff recommends the following season dates for white fronted or for white fronted geese from October 31st to January 33rd and January 23rd to February 14th. For dark and light geese, it would run from October 31st to November 1st, then from November 4th to February 14th. This would allow the light goose spring conservation order to begin February 15th and run through April 30th. Next slide, please. For the extended falconry season, staff recommends to adopt a 15-day season in the low plains unit, adopt a federal framework for daily bag limit, possession limit, and hawking hours, and staff recommends the season dates to run from February 24th to March 10th, please. With that, I would stand for any questions and thank you for your time and consideration. This is Commissioner Lauder. On the, set, for the second or third slide, was that something about people born after 2003 or did I- Those are the ones that, sure, that were, so basically 16 and older were available for the hunter survey. Born 2003 or before? Correct. Okay, I thought it was born after 2003. I thought, boy, you got some young <laughs> participants. Okay, are there any questions, this is Commissioner Lauber, are there any questions for Tom about these? Commissioner Gefeller here. Uh, yes. There, there was quite a bit of, of feedback on the, on the Southeast duck uh, zone and, and it seems to me if I remember all of the majority are favoring kind of keeping the seasons the same is that what this proposal does it it looks to me like it does I just want to make sure I'm I'm right on that this year there's a large shift in calendar dates um, you know the season last year started on the second Saturday this week it, this year it started on the first Saturday whoever provide, does provide uh Similar number of days in, in January's like last year. So this year they'd be 19 days uh, in January seasons for the Southeast zone where last year there's 21. So there's a, uh, a loss of two days in January but two days are gained in November. But there is the second Saturday opener is now to the first Saturday in the Southeast zone. So there's some slight changes due to calendar shift. Okay, and the background for those changes. Well, the, the, the part of it is the calendar shift and then from shifting from the first Saturday to the second Saturday was basically looking at past uh, migration data, hunter activity and, and harvest um, on that and this that was the November days, for, particularly from starting around November 7th are very important migration in the southeast zone and also very high hunter activity and harvest as well. And so you're trading off some opportunities for those early seasons versus some slighter, po less possibilities for those in, in January days. You're more likely to be frozen the first week of January than the first week of November. Okay, thank you. This is Commissioner, this is Commissioner Spohr. Go ahead. Uh, most of the calls that, well, all of the calls that I received were related to last year 
uh, there was just a five day split in January and this year there's a 10 day split. Those were most of my, all of my calls. So there was a concern there as to why it wasn't the same as it was last year. Uh, and you're, you're, I don't explain to me the calendar shift, Tom. I don't, I don't quite get that. Uh, traditionally the last day of the frameworks would be January, the last Sunday of January, which last year was January 26th. The last Sunday in January this year is January 31st. So that adds five additional days. So where those, those days went that there is a longer split, but they have more days post in the last part of January than they did last year. Again, we're losing two January days from this year compared to last year. So they're not a two week split, a, a big two week split that they, they perceive. And they are getting similar January number of January days. Commissioner Ryder, um, obviously, uh, um, I was surprised to see the uh, the recommended dates. I, I did expect to see the five day split. Um, even when we had the same calendar as we did in 2015, uh, we did go with the the five day split and and basically ha would have the same season. Um, you know, people were asking me what, what I thought it was going to be. And, you know, I told them, well, uh, we've been, or the department has been uh, consistent since, uh, 2015 and recommended the five day split, uh, at or near the beginning of January. And then going through the last Sunday of January, which of course, uh, this year would be, uh, the 31st, which I was really excited about, um, so I was kind of excited uh, to see how the uh, the way the calendar fell, um, because I just figured we were still going to stay with the the five day split, and um, I I didn't think I was going to, um, you know, I thought it was going to be you know pretty easy for me to to get in line with I guess with uh, what the department has consistently done over the last several years. Um, Typically, when I've argued in the past, uh, it's especially when the calendar is on the other end uh, of the, the, the seven day where we're starting maybe on November 9th or 8th, somewhere around there. And then uh, we're losing or we're having those earlier dates, but we're losing the back end of January. And so uh, I, I do see that um, it is very similar to last year, but I figured and I was kind of thinking that we were going to go along that lines of, uh, and I was excited with having those extra days there in January. Now, of course, my personal preference um, uh, would be to start as late as possible and run all the way through. And, and I understand that that's not really the, maybe the consensus of everybody out there, obviously. Um, but I did think, well, that this would be a nice compromise uh, to have that five-day split and be able to go to, to January 31st for, the, for those late season uh, um, enthusiasts. Um, so, uh, you know, I was a little surprised and shocked and I kind of had to get with a few people and say, hey, that's a little different than what it was or what I was anticipating, uh, you know, of course, the Southeast Zone was created for the late season and late migration. Uh, I think it was a great decision to create it. Um, kudos to those who put it together. I think it's been very beneficial for uh, the Southeast area. And I, I know it's sometimes, you know, you look at those surveys and you see, hey, why do we have so many zones? And it seems like this creates a kind of a mess. But I think it's uh, a really good idea to have those zones and uh, to have the, the discussion and back and forth with that. Um, one of the other reasons, you know, um, besides just creating this zone, um, I, I, I didn't feel like expanding the split uh, this year to 12 days with a weekend. Uh, I felt that kind of went ag against uh, the reasons of creating uh, of why the Southeast zone was created. Um, you know, in the past, I've also kind of argued 
that uh, even with the five day split, the entire state is is shut down through all the zones for those uh, five days. And this year it would be 12 days uh, with one of those being a weekend. And um, I'll, I do like, and I've argued, and I still think it's important to provide that opportunity uh, for those people that would like to travel through the various zones um, and, and hunt from early to mid-October all the way through, they at least have that opportunity if they want to. Um, you know, on the surveys, and, and we've heard this before, uh, people want to hunt, hunt when the ducks are here. And uh, that's the critical factor that we've seen and, and that, that I've heard too. Um, and, and I understand that there are possibly more freeze, freezes and, and times of ice in January. Uh, but I do think the opportunity is still there um, if people are willing to go to bigger water, some of the county or state lakes uh, that have public access um, and things of that nature. And also you have uh, dry land uh, opportunities as well, which you predominantly don't have as much in uh, the earlier season of November. So um, with that in mind, I, I would like the commission to consider going back to what we've consistently had for the, uh, for the last uh, few uh, years and have that five day split um, in January, very similar, basically comp copying the uh, 2015 season where we ran from November 14th to uh, January 3rd, have the five day split, even though I'm not a big fan of having the split where everybody shut down uh, and then going from January 9th uh, to uh, the end of January 31st. So I'd, uh, if anybody has any discussion over that, I'd, I'd like to hear it. And, and uh, But I think that that would be uh, consistent and, you know, um, I think that would be what's best from what I'm hearing uh, in this area. And, you know, when I go to Ducks Unlimited uh, banquets and, and Turkey Federation banquets and just out and about with, with lots of hunters, um, that's, that's what I hear on a personal level, so. Okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Lauber, uh, I've received a lot of emails and the emails are kind of all over the place, sort of like the survey comments. Uh, a lot of the emails say we're starting the season too late in the southeast zone. Those particularly the people who are in the north part of that southeast zone. I hear some that say we, are, we need to have more days in January. I have a lot of people that have read the recommendations and have asked that we go ahead and uh, approve these. If I were to look at the emails that I get that are sort of all over the place, I tend to think the recommendation that uh, staff has provided probably most effectively uh, benefits or, or is in line with the preference of most of the people that I have. Uh, I think November 14th is a late start and uh, I like to have an opportunity for the early migrants. We are getting an extra five days by the way the calendar falls in January. So I hate to have that split reduced and take it all away from the front end. If there's a way it could be re replaced someplace else, maybe so. But I kind of like the staff recommendations and they tend to be consistent with the preferences described in the emails I've received. Somebody else has something to say, I'm sure. Yeah, this is this is Commissioner Spohr. The one thing that I look at when you look at those dates is January 3rd, the state of Kansas, there's no more duck hunting for a period of time in any zone. I like Commissioner Ryder's idea of moving that up and it, the high plain zone should be October 17th to January 10th 
and then have the split. And then the southeast zone should be November 14th and January 10. I just think that yes, there's just a period of time there. And I know Commissioner Ryder has mentioned this multiple times about having opportunities for people to go other places and hunt. Uh, I, I see that January 3rd day, I, I see that as a problem where there's there's no hunting in, in three of the four zones. Well, actually all four of the zones is, is my opinion. This is Commissioner Sill. I have a question for Tom. On your survey results, do you have an end number? What was your total number of samples um, that were hunting or from the southeast zone? <coughs> the percentage is in your survey results, but I'm wondering what your end number was. It will just take me a minute to find the end number um, in the survey results here. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you, but you can continue conversations as, as I can. Um, look for that. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain why that piece is important. I think, and when I look at the emails and the phone calls that I've heard from folks, um, I see a tendency there. But when I look at these survey results, I see a tendency in the opposite direction. And I'm curious if this has just been a vocal um, minority that I've heard from recently, which I very much appreciate they're contacting me. But if there's a larger number who completed your survey results and 30% say that on average, the Southeast zone is too late um, and that it's pretty darn split even between the preference between January and November, then those survey results, if those are representative of a large number of people for me, somewhat offset these phone calls and emails that I've gotten recently. But if your survey results were 50 people, then it doesn't carry as much weight as if it was a larger number or 10 people and compared to that, if that makes sense. Sure. So looking at the results, we had around a little, uh, little over seven, uh, 1,700 responses. Out of that, 825 said that they either rarely hunted the zone, occasionally hunted the zone, or frequently hunted the zone. 371 noted that they frequently hunted the southeast zone. So that's about 22% of respondents. Okay, thanks, Tom. That's helpful to me. Other, other questions for Tom? Any questions or any public comment? Well, here's we're going to have to make a decision here. We have staff recommendations. Uh, I think Lauren made it made a good point, but I think there's a fair amount of. Uh, I wish we could have another five days to give the the hunters, but we don't. Uh, I guess to start with, I'm going to ask for a motion that we adopt staff regulations. I may or may not get it. Uh, Commissioner Gefeller and, and uh, you know, I, based on uh, the question Commissioner Sill posed and, and got an answer to, and, and because, uh, I, you know, the, a lot of the, the response I've gotten has been a very recent response and, and actually not a lot. Uh, I think about five of seven emails in favor of keeping the season as it was. Uh, so on the basis of the survey and the staff recommendation, uh, I would move that we approve the staff recommendation. Commissioner Sill, I would second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt staff recommendations. Is there any discussion from the commission? Yeah, this is Commissioner Spore. There's there's a couple issues that 
continually come up in the fact that the studies all show that migration continues to get later as time goes on for, for many, many reasons. And one thing within that survey that Tom gave us, everybody wants to hunt ducks when the ducks are here. And if the ducks are coming later, we have to start shifting our seasons to accommodate that. I am, I am totally good with the Low Plains Lake. I think he's, I think Tom is right on with that Low Plains Lake. But the High Plains and the Southeast Zone particularly need to be adjusted a little bit to accommodate the fact that the ducks are coming later. Thank you. Commissioner Lover, uh, Tom, from time to time, we, we hear that the ducks are all coming later and yet it seems to be a familiar theme that there's a lot of activity and a lot of migration early as well. Would you comment on that? So we have different uh, populations and species that move through different times. You know, most when you're talking about January hunting, you're nearly always talking about mallards and mallards make up about 50% of our annual harvest each year. It's as high as 60% in some years and as low as 40 in other years. We have been moving seasons backwards um, in, in response to this, the Southeast zone. You know, now we're having seasons two weeks later in the Southeast zone than we did 10 years ago. Again, same with you know, our seasons used traditionally in January, around the first part of January. So we have accounted for some of those later migrations and some of these populations with later season dates. And a lot of that is more hunter preference driven than, than biological ones. What we see for peak migration days in the Southeast zone is usually right around Thanksgiving with high numbers showing up in early November there um, and then kind of tailoring off and, and then having some other peaks um, depending on other cycles. But we still have a considerable number of ducks that move based on the calendar and then coming in later. Commissioner Lauber, over the last decade, the Southeast zone has probably had its opener move back up almost two weeks, hasn't it? It has varied. I think, you know, the first five years, we had five different season structures. Um, our average opening day has been around November 9th, um, the Southeast zone. And so we, we haven't, uh, this year it'd be two days earlier than compared to some past years. Um, you know, it's really a balancing act of hunter preferences. Probably our most vocal hunters are the ones wanting the later seasons but they are still a kind of a minority of what we hear from, from all hunters or all the hunting community. Again, no, we're looking at differences of five to seven days. It's really no right or wrong answer. It's really a hunter's preference of what they are and who that hunter is you're asking. Okay. Other comments from the public or commission? Yeah. Commissioner Ryder again, I, I would agree with Tom. Uh, he's right on at Thanksgiving is uh, uh, peak migration. I think that that's a really good time to get out. Um, I do think uh, if you get too uh, far earlier th than that though, especially into the first uh, week, at week and a half of uh, November, you're, you are missing out on some of those days, um, which is, one of, uh, like I said, one of the reasons why I really thought that uh, we were gonna uh, keep keep the five-day split there in, uh, in January and then uh, have the, the, the regular or the uh, similar start date of November uh, 14th, like we did in 2014. Uh, 2016 or 2015, 2016, we have November 12th. 2017, we had November 11th. And it just flowed down uh, the calendar um, to November 10th and November 9th. And so uh, that's why, uh, you know, I really figured that we would flip when the calendar flipped, we go back to November 14th. And then once again, uh, we would work our way uh, down to it, even though it really wasn't uh, not my preference and, and uh, not gonna really gone along with it or, or liked it. Uh, but I thought that uh, this was going to be a good uh, compromise uh, in, in having those later times 
in January without uh, a big split and a loss of a weekend in January as well. Um, so I think my big thing, uh, like I've said, and Troy kind of hit again, there is uh, that extended period there in January um, where we are um, kind of missing out uh, on everything being closed. Um, and I understand that the, the times are very similar to last year and the dates of January, um, but that was kind of the, the earliest of what we had been being consistent with, with the calendar. So this is Tom Drosky. And we know we see this with, with all, all the calendar shift dates on the opening day, you know, whether it's October 7th or October 14th for the early zone or Jan October 31st for the late zone. You know, really, ideally way to shorten that up would be to pick like we do for uh, our webless seasons where we pick a date, say, you no know, November 10th, it's the Saturday closest to that. That would take out a lot of these, well, is it the first Saturday or second Saturday arguments? You could shorten that argument by three or four days. But again, you know, in the big picture, again, we're, we're talking about five to seven days of, of, the, of the season, of a 74-day season. Well, uh, I would, uh, Commissioner Ryder, I would like to amend the regulation for the Southeast zone uh, to go from November 14th to January 3rd with a five day split and then reopen the second segment, January 9th uh, to uh, January 31st. <laughs> Okay, that that's an amendment, and that's a that's a, every time we get to this, Chris, you have to walk us through it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris Timerson, these are really done by consensus. We don't necessarily need a vote, but since this has now become a contentious issue, we're going to go ahead and uh, treat it like we would treat regulations. And so, <clears throat> if uh, Commissioner Ryder would like to amend the recommendation of the department, then we'll go with a motion and a second. There's already been a motion and a second to discuss or to accept the agency uh, recommendation. So uh, if I'm assuming Commissioner Ryder made that amendment just now or proposed the amendment. So now we're waiting on a second. I would second it, Commissioner Spohr. Okay. Chris Timerson again. So then we'll go ahead and uh, you can call or have more discussion, Mr. Chairman, your prerogative. Uh, Tom Podrowski, just a, a point of order is the amendment for just the Southeast zone or for the High Plains zone that was requested by Commissioner Spore as well. Oh, in an effort to partner, I would just settle for the Southeast zone and let the High Plains zone go. Respectfully to my two commissioners, I, I'm going to vote no on this because I like staff recommendations and I think that November 14th is late for the Southeast zone. And so that's my two cents worth. Is there any other discussion on this amendment? If there's no discussion on the amendment, then I guess Sheila calls a roll call vote. I, I, excuse I me. A, I have a question then. Are we voting on the amendment? Yes. Or on the amended regulation? I mean, we're for voting on the amendment. And if the amendment doesn't pass, we'll go back and vote on the original motion that you and Commissioner Gefeller made and seconded. Thank you for the cl clarification, Commissioner Self. Sheila? Uh, Commissioner Cross? Uh, yes. Commissioner Gefeller? No. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sell? No. Commissioner Sporer? Yes. Commissioner Lauber. No. Passed 4 3. Okay. 
now we vote on the uh, uh, motion for uh, that was originally made, or do we have, or, or do we start over? Mr. Chairman, if I might, it would be you're going to vote on the the recommendations as amended for the southeast zone. Okay. The recommendations as amended for the Southeast Zone and the amendments are the Southeast Zone has a, a late start date and less of a split in January. Is that it? Commissioner Ryder, yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion as amended? I'm, uh, this is Commissioner Spore. I'm confused. I thought we just voted on the amendment to move the seasons for the Southeast zone. We did. But wouldn't we, now we have to vote on all the seasons for all zones, right? As, as amended. That would be correct. correct. Yeah. So, so now we're just voting on the high plains and the low plains late. No. We had a motion to recommend, or to, we had a motion to uh, approve staff, regula staff recommendations. We had a motion and a second and an amendment to change the late zone southeast to a different start date. That amendment passed. So the original motion, which is basically all of staff recommendations, but the amendment is now to be passed or voted down. Commissioner, Com Commissioner Ryder, I move to accept as amended. Commissioner Hazlett, I'll second. Is that two motions on the floor that are the same? Mr. Chairman, if I might, yes, it, that would be it. There was the original motion to accept staff recommendations. There was a, an amended amendment proposed, which passed, which amended the original staff recommendations. Now we're back on the original staff recommendations with the amendment. So it's the overall package. Right. Uh, including uh, the goose seasons and the Rangers. We have two motions on the table, but I think I know what people mean to do. And uh, I think the motions are identical, that we accept staff recommendations, except the Southeast zone staff recommendation has been modified. Is that your understanding, Aaron? Yes. Okay, so if there any discussion on that, we'll have a vote. If there's no discussion. No discussion, then Sheila? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? Yes. Commissioner Spore? Yes. Commissioner Lauber. Yes. Pass seven zero. Okay. Uh, now, Tom, let's talk about the uh, duck hunting zones. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I have another short presentation. If, if Jason, if you can switch it over. Fish and Wildlife considers state's request to change duck hunting zone boundaries every five years. But the next opportunity for Kansas to alter its duck hunting zones will be for the 2021-2022 seasons. Zoning is the establishment of independent seasons in two or more areas within a state for the purpose of providing more equitable distribution of harvest opportunities. Since 1972, Kansas 
waterfowl seasons have had zone splits or zones or splits in the seasons with the zone added in 1996 and the zone southeast zone in 2011. Next slide, please. Physiographical diverse states have added, like Kansas, has added difficulty in selecting season pace that will accommodate hunted duck species and hunting styles. Also, zoning can add regulation complexity. It allows for flexibility and maximizing opportunity by matching season dates with available habitat types, migration patterns, and season preferences of duck hunters for specific areas. And waterfowl hunters are just as diverse as Kansas' waterfowl hunting opportunities. Zones and splits are tools to help serve that broad constituent base. The benefits of zoning increases under restrictive length as we're placed from 1988 to 1992, where there is only 39 days to the season. Next slide, please. So what do, so do we have to abide by when zoning? This are the federal frameworks. First, the zones are contiguous. They cannot be disjunct areas. And this Kansas zone boundaries have their distinct shapes as we try to connect similar hunting areas to each other. Zones can only be implemented during the general duck season, so September teal or other special seasons are not part of this consideration. The High Plains unit is not eligible for rezoning and not part of this discussion. And Kansas does not have any grandfather zone boundaries. Boundaries are set for every for, for, set for five years, but season days and bag limits can be adjusted annually. Zones fit into one of the four options. Currently, Kansas operates under option three, where we have three zones and two season segments. Results of both the scoping meetings and formal hunter survey suggest that the majority of duck hunters are satisfied with current zone boundaries. However, similar to waterfowl season dates, there are segments of the hunting community that would prefer adjustments to Kansas duck zones. However, many of these are polarized opinions of what exactly these adjustments should be. This suggests that season conflicts are more important, more of a hunter preference issue than they are a geographical one. Staff is recommending no changes to Kansas' con current configuration for duck zone boundaries. We'll be glad to answer, with that, be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for your time and considerations. Uh, this is Commissioner Spohr. Uh, Tom, is there any chance next year that somehow you can get the feds to reconsider how those zones have to be continuous and be able to circle Jamestown and not have to have such an ugly map as as you saw in the survey, you know, lots and lots of lots of their comments were based on how confusing that zoning is for that early zone. Is there any chance of getting that ruling changed? So the, the feds consider it every five years and any changes in the federal frameworks would have done the year prior. Uh, that was a, a request that Kansas had made to the feds during this process that was denied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Service Regulation Commission. So again, we'll probably again offer this up again in 2026 or 25 when we can change changes to those federal frameworks. But again, now we're, we're set with what the federal works are for the past five years. Again, we did try a pretty hard effort and push and had some state support, but at the end, the Fish and Wildlife Service deemed it unnecessary. And this would add to regulation complexity with, with those disjunct zones. Do you see any way that I'm not aware of or the commission's not aware of that we could get away from this? Do you see any way to, to make it less confusing? So zones does add a lot of complexity, but it does add, you know, we do it for the sake of adding uh, opportunities. 
Um, you know, the problem anywhere you draw a line boundary is that you always want what your neighbor has on the other side. Um, so what we kind of currently are is, is kind of the best option. One thing that does help with that is some stability and regulation process. When you change those zone boundaries from year to year or from every five year to five years, that's when it gets more confusing. But again, if we could have some stability to this, uh, we made this change five years ago to, the, to allow Cedar Bluff to be in the late zone rather than early. Um, so we try to use highway boundaries as our markers as much as possible and, and major roads, but they are confusing. And, and at first glance, they might not make sense. But if you look at some of the reasoning behind it, some of the, you know, migration data, hunter preference data of, of why we draw these boundaries as we do. Yeah, I'm not, as Commissioner Spore, I'm not arguing that the fact that Jamestown and the bottoms and some of those specific other areas had not to be early zones. I'm just... I'm, we're just talking about the, 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 the area between Jamestown and the bottoms that gets really confusing. That's, that's my only comment. Yeah. And it, it was kind of a, a tough slice when we did make that change in 2011, you know, it was pretty evident that Cedar Bluff did not belong in the early zone. And, and we try to make the least invasive way to cut James down, down to the bottoms. And that was going through the Smoky Hills as we have. And we do know there are issues there, but they are small compared to what we gain by moving Cedar Bluff into the late zone. Commissioner Lauber, I think that the, the map is confusing and squiggly, but I would rather leave it the way it is than try to adjust it because each squiggle was the result of some demand or hunter preference. And uh, I think it's probably less headache if we leave it alone. Yeah, this is Commissioner Spohr. I'm not, I'm not asking to do anything with it. I'm saying it, it's a federal regulation as why it is what it is. And I'm not asking to change it. I'm just asking if there's ever an opportunity for the feds to, to, to be able to figure out that we've got a problem here. Commissioner Lauber, I would encourage uh, Tom and his staff, anytime they see an opening to where they can pursue having non-contiguous zones, go for it but I just don't know if the feds are going to do it. I, uh, this is Tom Podrowski again. So there was some very interesting conversations at the Service Regulation Committee meeting. Some of the um, mountain estates gave a really good argument about having uh, valleys be in the same zone rather than having trying to connect them through some mountain pass or something like that. And I can gladly share some of those discussions with you that are um, taken as notes from the Service Regulation Commission meeting. But there is a that some state efforts for it we pushed very hard, particularly by Nebraska and Kansas that has some of these obstacles. This is Commissioner Sell, um, as one who lives quite near some of those squiggly lines up around the McPherson Valley wetlands, there it is confusing. And reading through the number of comments about that, I'm supportive of that. Um, there is one place where there could be a simplification made. Um, as I see it in this area around the McPherson Valley wetlands, as you drop down, uh, I think it's 14th Avenue out of McPherson, it currently goes to Arapaho Road. If you drop that down one more mile to Apache Road, you can follow Apache Road straight across. It's the county line road between McPherson Reno County and Reno Rice County. And eventually it will hit 61. As it stands now, you drop down, it, it drops down to Arapaho Road over to 61, follows 61 down south to include the city of Hutch and South Hutch, and then back up 96. So you're not gaining any hunting territory at all. You're just including the city of Hutchison and a whole lot more squiggles. So if you came south on 14th Ave to Apache instead of Arapaho, followed the county line straight across to 96. I might've said 61 a minute ago, I meant 96. 
it will eliminate one little boot heel full of squiggles and about three lines of verbiage in the description of that zone. C Commissioner Wabber, Tom, we can't do anything about the zones now anyway, can we? Don't we have to wait till every five years? So this is our opportunity to read, uh, draw any zone boundary within Kansas. We can't change the federal frameworks, but we can make an adjustment um, as, as suggested um, at this current time. Do they have to approve it? Yes, yeah, so the approval process would be when we submit our season selection letters, we'll send in our zone descriptions and they will review it and see as long as it makes uh, their federal framework guidelines. So they, they do review it, but it's it's a some more based on what's in the frameworks, not uh, what our description or changes are or reasoning changes. Did Commissioner Lauber, did you get a sense from the duck meetings that there was any desire to have any boundaries changed? So the two big areas, one was career, whether it should be in the late zone or early zone. And there's a lot of complex issues there. We're dealing with everything from water rights to uh, bird use to private land versus public lands and where you draw all those boundaries around there. The most, most conversation we got from the public meetings was probably surrounding Corvera. Uh, second would be mostly McPherson, um, based off some of those changes that were made in 2011 to include all of the McPherson wildlife area into a single areas. There's some private land holdings there that are particularly upset about, about some of those changes as it affects them. But the McPherson is probably number two areas of where we get number of comments of requesting a change. Commissioner Lauber, are we, are we wanting to change, consider changing the zones because we, want to stop the unattractive squiggly lines or are we doing it to move a hunting area to a different zone? Because if it's just strictly to eliminate the squiggly lines, I would say we just leave it alone. Commissioner Sill, um, in reading the surveys, and um, a slight amount of just personal opinion from it is that um, the confusion over where all those boundaries are can limit some hunters who are maybe borderline whether I'm going to go or not go, especially if they have to go alone and they're not going with other duck hunters who hunt frequently where they don't have a set place where they go frequently. Um, and I think that while the numbers may be fairly small, I think the confusion does discourage some hunters. That would be my concern in the simplification is to remove a barrier for some hunters. This, this is Tom Bedrowski, uh, Commissioner Seal. So I'm, I'm looking at your uh, recommendation here, suggestion. And you're talking about moving the uh, boundary one mile south along Apache Road rather than App um, Arapaho Road. Is that correct? Yeah, if I looked at it right, maybe I read my maps wrong today. So, too, Tom, but... Yeah, the, the uh, Arapaho Road was chosen because it was a paved road. So it kind of is one of those more physical barriers that hunters can rely on than the Apache Road might be just a, a blacktop or, or gravel road. I think that was the some of the discussions back then why Arapaho Road was, was chosen for that. Um, we're trying to hook the lake in, or the southern part of McPherson Valley wetlands there. I think that's the um, either Little Sinkhole or Chain of Lakes down there that we're trying to include by going down to Arapaho Road to catch them. It was just the, the need to include all of the city of Hutch and South Hutch um, and dropping down that, further south didn't make much sense uh, to me. I didn't understand that. Sure, we, we had looked at that to get maybe more river access in there where you could draw a line over from, you said it like Apache Road there, 
or the, the county line marker and run it back. But again, we use Highway 61 that catches that portions of, of Hutch uh, just because of it's a, a large four lane barrier that the hunters can readily have to cross or know they're crossing, whether in the zone where a county line is, is kind of more of an imaginary line than a, a physical boundary. Okay. I don't have a, a big agenda to change it at all. It's, but it, I do stand behind that idea that simplifying it removes a barrier for some hunters. And I'd like to see that if there's ways to do that in the future. I realize it's a short time frame right now, but that would just be my perspective. And a good suggestion is, no, we try to remove, remove, remove barriers where they're, they're regulatory um, or not. So you know, it is a good suggestion that you know, we, we, we try to consider. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lauber, I, 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 I see these points. Somehow I think changing these on the fly uh, no pun intended. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to go ahead and suggest that we, uh, when will be the next opportunity we can do something about this? We have to wait five years from this year. So yes, yeah, so we would kick off the process again in 2025, either by changing the federal frameworks again, like things like with the contiguous zone requirements and then getting public feedback, then it would be available for the 2026 slash 2027 hunting season. I guess. I'm caught a little off guard with this because it was pretty much my analysis of the synopsis from the meetings that people were generally happy with the zones. And only when I read the comments did I hear anything about being, being difficult to follow. And uh, maybe those people put comments on a survey, but didn't go to the, the, the waterfowl meetings that you held. That is, yeah, the, this is Tom Bedrowski, that the people that we do find that do go to meetings are active waterfowl hunters. So they're more likely to participate. You know, one of the reasons we do these large mail surveys is to catch the casual hunters where things like regulations might be a little bit more uh, of an issue. The one that actively hunts are probably more aware of these own boundaries than say someone that maybe once every other year or one or two times a year so they're less familiar with their zone boundaries. Commissioner Lauber here, the casual hunter though is never bashful about an anonymous comment. I'm going to ask that we uh, approve staff recommendations again. Didn't work out very well last time but I'd like to have a motion that we do that for the duck hunting zones. Commissioner Spore, I move. I'll second. Commissioner Sell. Any additional discussion from the public? Any additional discussion from, from the commission? Lauren, those were good comments, just the same. Uh, Sheila? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? Yes. Commissioner Sporer? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Staff 7 0. Okay. KAR 115757. These Zoom meetings take longer in the evening. Matt? There we go. You got me now, Gerald? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Yes, this is KR 115.25.7 antelope open season bag limit and permits. Um, these unit boundaries are, so I've, present, I've presented this a couple of times. It's a brief regulation, so I'll just hit the highlights for you here real quick. The unit boundaries are defined in 115.46 with units 2, 17, and 18 open to hunting. And 
as always, there is a uh, figure of those units in your briefing book. Um, starting with the archery season, the, the dates are September 19 through 27 and October 10 through 31. These are standard uh, the, and uh, archery permits are valid in all three units. And these permits are unlimited and available to both residents and non-residents. The firearm season dates are proposed October 2 through 5 of 2020. These permits are limited to residents and we're proposing 110 for unit two, 40 for unit 17 and eight for unit 18. The muzzleloader season dates are September 28 through October 5 of 2020. These permits are also limited to residents. We're proposing 30 permits for unit two, 10 for unit 18, for unit 17, and four for unit 18. Um, unit two and 17 limited permits are the same as last year. In unit 18, we have reduced permits from 16, to 16 uh, limited draw down to 12 total. So we cut firearm and archery permits each by two. And so with that, I will turn this back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is there any, is there any uh, discussion uh, from the commission? Any questions from, from Matt? Mr. Gefeller, I move to approve the recommendation. Uh, can I have a second? Commissioner Small, second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any uh, any more discussion? Okay, Sheila. Commissioner Cross. Yes. Commissioner Gefeller. Yes. Commissioner Hazlett. Yes. Commissioner Ryder. Yes. Commissioner Sill. Yes. Commissioner Sporer. Yes. Commissioner Lobby. Yes. Okay, Matt, you want to discuss uh, elk? Yes, elk is next, 115.25.8. Um, the unit boundaries for elk are defined in 115.46b, and units two and three are open to hunting. Uh, again, there's a, there's a figure in your uh, briefing book, and the only part of the state that's not open to elk hunting uh, is a little area uh, in the uh, southwest corner that encompasses Cimarron National Grasslands. Um, the proposed archery season date for elk are September 14 through December 31 in units two and three outside of Fort Riley. And the season dates on Fort Riley will be September 1 through 30. And Fort Riley is subunit 2A. The proposed firearm season dates off of Fort Riley are October 1 through 31. And that was the early season we established um, due to some depredation concerns. Then we also have a December 2 through 13 firearm season, and that overlaps with the firearm deer season. And then we also have a January 1 through March 15 firearm season. And those are all off Fort Riley. <laughs> on, Fort, on Fort Riley, the uh, firearm season dates are October 1 through December 31 with October being the first second, the month of November being the second segment, and the month of December is the third segment. The proposed muzzleloader season dates both on and off Fort Riley are September 1 through 30 of 2020. And uh, limited quota either sex elk permits are valid during any open season, and we're proposing 12 of those be authorized. And so those are the any elk permits for Fort Riley. And then the, um, the antlerless elk permits of the same type, we're proposing uh, six of those Six of those be valid during each segment or 18 total. So six would be valid during October, six antlerless elk permits in November and six in December on Fort Riley. Again, that's the same uh, as were recommended last year. Uh, the elk permits are available only to Kansas residents and limited quota permit applications are separated into military and non-military applicants prior to the actual draw. Um, an unlimited number of hunt on your own land, antlerless only, and either sex elk permits are authorized in units two and three. 
and an unlimited number of general resident and landowner tenant um, antlerless only and either sex permits are authorized in unit three. So with that, I'll turn, turn this back to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, anybody have any questions for Matt? Any questions from the public? Is I don't know if there is any public, but uh, uh, if not, can I have a motion? Commissioner Cross, move to approve. Commissioner Hansen, I'll second. second it. Who seconded that? Commissioner Ryder. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that uh, we, appro we approve uh, KAR 115.25.8. There's no other discussion. Hearing none, Sheila. Commissioner Cross. Yes. Commissioner Gefeller. Yes. Commissioner Hazlett. Yes. Commissioner Ryder. Yes. Commissioner Sill. Yes. Commissioner Spore. Yes. Commissioner Lauber. Yes. Pass seven zero. All right. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Thank you. All right. Can we? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Levi Jaster, big game uh, program coordinator. Um, so the first thing is 115.4-2, uh, which is the <laughs> big game and wild turkey general provisions. Um, includes uh, tagging of animals. Uh, and what we're looking at is the proof of sex. Uh, prior to this, the regulation required that on a big game animal, the head had to remain attached to the carcass as proof of sex. Uh, because of the risk of chronic wasting disease and spreading that, we want to uh, change that to remove uh, requiring the head and change that to having the visible sex organs of the big game animal remain naturally attached to the carcass or a quartered portion of the carcass. Um, just to allow hunters to voluntarily uh, remove the most infective portion of a carcass in the field um, as a best practice. And so that is the change to 115.4-2. Okay, is there any questions for Levi? Yeah, this is Commissioner Spore. So they're not going to have to leave uh, identifying sex parts, is that what you're saying? No, they they don't leave the, sorry, Levi Jaster, the, uh, they don't have to leave the head. What they have to leave are the visible sex organs. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lauber, they can leave one or the other. Yes. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion for approval? Commissioner Hazlett, I move approval. Commissioner Sill, I second. Been moved and seconded that we approve KAR 115.42. Is there any discussion? Uh, hey, Commissioner Ryder, I do have a question. Does this uh, deal with um, Tagging a turkey. No, the, Levi Jasper, the, uh, the portion for turkey would remain the same. It has to have um, the, the beard uh, attached to the breast. Okay. So, uh, could, I don't know whether this is a question for you, for you or someone else, but I did have a question with the new app. How is, if somebody has, how do they t tag their turkey if they bought their permit and have their uh, permit on their app? Um, that's not your area. Yeah, it's it's not. I was going to ask if uh, is Doug still around? 
Mr. Chairman, this is Mike Miller. So we don't have the electronic tagging in place yet, but in the in the near future we will we will, and you would have an electronic tag that would be connected to your permit on the on your mobile device. Um, we have talked about using a photograph, kind of like the electronic registration, right. um, and, it, and you would validate that tag um, on your mobile device, and you would receive a confirmation number that would allow you to transport that animal or that right. Bird. Okay, Commissioner Lauber, right now, can you get a tag on your phone? And if so, there is no way to tag it. This is Mike Miller. We don't have the tagging in place yet on the electron on the phone. Right, Doug? He's muted. I yep, I got you. <clears throat> Yes, we had hoped to have it out in time for spring turkey season, but with the COVID issues and things, it's been delayed a little. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking we'll probably have something in a couple of weeks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Ryder. So if somebody has purchased it and they have that uh, in their wallet, they still need to print out a paper copy to attach no, to their we are going to. Uh, I think the way it's supposed to be, be functioning is that when you purchase your permits, you will be asked whether you want to use paper tags or you mm -hmm. want to use electronic tags. We're not going to give them both because we want to eliminate a potential for fraud where people might have two sets of tags. Sure. So it'll be uh, set up so that it'll make a choice and then they'll use it uh, whichever choice they opted for when they made the purchase. I guess, Commissioner Lauber, I guess my question is today, could I have a tag on my phone? Could I have a permit on my phone and no means with which to tag a harvested turkey? Yes, if you buy a if you buy a turkey permit, you'll have the permit on your phone. You just won't have the the tags will sh won't show up on there for fulfillment though. You'll just show that you have a turkey permit and what tags you you purchase, but you won't be able to fulfill them. And I hope I can explain that to a game warden. In well, theory. you should have the paper tags if you opted for paper, you'll have them. But what if you opted for electronic or digital? We have it. Well, if you do eventually, you'll have, it'll be on your phone. But you, it, that hasn't rolled out yet. But when it rolls out, I, I got it. You, you can't get it on your phone yet. Right. You can right. only, yeah, there will, it, okay. I was thinking that half of it was available and the tagging half was not. My mistake. Okay. Uh, we have writer, uh, that was my understanding as well. Uh, I bought mine on my computer and printed it out, but I did have someone that that purchased it on their app on their phone and had it uh, their permit, but they didn't understand what they needed to do to tag the turkey. So they need to go online and print it on onto the website and print it out right now as it is right now, Commissioner Ryder, if I didn't say that before. Yes, this is Doug again, and that's correct. They will need okay. to print their tags. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lauber, does that answer your question, Aaron? Commissioner Ryder, yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Is there any more discussion? Okay, Sheila. Commissioner Cross. Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? Yes. Commissioner Storer? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Okay, Levi, 115 4 4. 115 4 4 is the uh, big game legal equipment taking methods. And so the change to this is to strike the language that uh, prohibits the use of a mock draw on a vertical bow. Um, so that, you know, it would, you would not require a special permit currently. The, uh, you can use these if you uh, apply and get a special uh, permit from uh, through our law enforcement um, as part of a uh, under 
18 dash seven uh, for, you know, hand, typically for uh, a handicap or uh, older hunter that uh, needs the uh, assistance of the device. Um, it cleans us up the regulation up a little bit um, by preventing that and uh, reduces uh, the, the need for the handful of folks that use those to get a, uh, have to do that extra work to get those permits. Is there any discussion, any questions for Levi? Yes, I have this representative Paisley. I have a question. You're, are you saying that it, it is only available to handicap or youth? Currently, yes. Um, uh, and I would think that that would be, you know, a medical allowance too. Okay, so it's not for general public that we're... It, it's not, not available to the general public yet um, or at this time. Uh, but what we've seen is that, you know, it's a handful of people that have to go through the extra effort of getting this permit, and this would allow them to do that without having to go through that extra effort. Passing this regulation would allow the general public to acquire one or to be able to use one without a permit. Yes, correct. But Commissioner Ryder, and that, as I understand it, would be similar in similarly in line with um, a crossbow as as you see it is that correct levi jaster yes that would be correct and uh, commissioner Ryder, and the crossbow currently is available for uh, general public use levi jaster yes it is currently Commissioner Sill, I'm a little curious if anybody has gotten any public comment in support of this. Um, I've gotten a fair amount of emails, phone calls, texts um, opposing it from archers. Um, and I think because it's an archery related regulation that their voice is important. But I'm curious if you if any of the other commissioners have gotten support in, you know, voices in support of the of the passage of this. Commissioner Aislett again, I have received opposition to it with the comment we've already we already have crossbows and we've allowed those to modify up to where you know they're pretty lethal. So we don't need it. And if it is something specific for handicapped person that they can get it by you know I probably don't have any problem with that. But I think just putting another article like that on the market, I, I don't understand. It. Commissioner Lauber, I've not received any comments really one way or the other. There's been thought, uh, some comments at a previous meeting. Uh, you know, there's some archers are trying to say, well, we don't know why you'd want one. It doesn't make it any more accurate. And, uh, I guess I'm of the opinion it probably doesn't really make a lot of difference one way or the other. It doesn't, it, there, we had some discussion about whether or not it made a fair chase difference. I'm not sure it makes a lot of difference, uh, but I've not received a lot of feedback either way. Commissioner yeah. Red, I have received, I think maybe two uh, correspondents uh, not in favor. Um, it was, my understanding was that they were um, more in line with the traditional um, bow hunters. They think it would be bad for bow hunting. Uh, they would probably would have been, uh, I would imagine, not in favor of crossbows as well. Um, I've, I've tried to figure out what would be the difference and maybe somebody can explain. Uh, we've already got the crossbows. So how would adding the draw lock uh, to a compound bow be that much different. I I don't see it, but somebody else could have a different perspective uh, that would help me out. Bow hunters tend to be against a lot of new stuff. And uh, 
I don't think this makes a lot of difference in an, in an answer to your question, Aaron. I don't think it is any fundamentally difference from a crossbow, but I'm not sure it's going to be sought after by that many people. This is Commissioner Cross. With that being said, uh, Levi, uh, this would eliminate another obstacle for those people that did need to have this draw lock, correct? Levi Jaster, yes, that's correct. All right, thank you. Mr. Any Chairman, else? Mr. Chairman, Mike Miller, uh, Pratt, just as a point of clarification, this may have come about with questions we received over the years of to why we allow a crossbow, but we won't allow a draw lock on a compound bow because basically a crossbow has a draw lock on it. And we this, this draw lock was um, a, a special permit was provided before crossbows were part of our uh, archery equipment. And so it allowed somebody with uh, certain um, limitations to shoot a bow when they couldn't hold it at full draw. But the questions we receive in the, in the uh, recently have been, why don't we allow a, dr a draw lock when you can shoot a crossbow, which essentially is that lock draw. So I don't think yeah. the demand for these special permits is very high. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Gefeller, I, th th that's what I recall from the workshop uh, sessions we had and the input we had before that uh, there didn't seem, it didn't seem to make sense to have uh, crossbow availability and not, not allow draw locks. And, you know, archery purists can still be archery purists. They don't have to use them. And those uh, who have a, a particular need, from what I understand, you can draw the bow uh, if, if you don't have uh, physical ability to do it. You can with a draw lock by standing on the bow and drawing and locking. Um, and then I, too, have received very little public feedback uh, other than at our commission meetings, uh, one way or the other. So I, I, no, go ahead. Well, I didn't know if there's more discussion. I, I would just make a motion to approve the regulation as presented if, if uh, it's appropriate at this time. Can I have a second? Commissioner Ryder, I second. Been moved and seconded that we make this change. Is there any more discussion? I think this is one opportunity um, to listen. Folks say, you know, why why participate? You don't listen to us. If we've not received any public support of this, I do understand, Levi and Mike, why it does clean some things up. I do. But I also understand that there is a fair amount of public um, opposition to it. And I think it is an opportunity to show people that we are listening, just as with Commissioner Ryder and the duck seasons earlier, wanted to be listened to that group. I think this is an opportunity to listen to what has been said to us. Commissioner Lauber, I, I see your point, but trust me, the bow hunters get listened to a lot. And uh, they are not an ignored group. And uh, I kind of agree with Warren, if you want to be a purist, don't use it. And uh, that's sort of my, my feeling. Is there any other discussion? Well, uh, Commissioner Gapeller, again, just correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me we had quite a bit of public support at, at the meetings, at commission meetings. Uh, explaining how it's used and, and support for the use of it and explaining how it helps people that have physical deficiencies. So I, I, I was under the understanding I had, and, and we got asked, uh, you know, long, some long written support previously. So I was the under the understanding we've had uh, a fair amount of support expressed for this. Commissioner Lauber, I think it was the support for it is why it got on that on the agenda to begin with. Uh, it was the negative comments by the bow hunters that surfaced later. Any other discussion? Sheila? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? No. Commissioner Sporer? 
Commissioner Sporer. Should I just skip him? Yeah. Commissioner Lauber. Yes. Task six one. Five one, excuse me. Okay, you got another one, Levi? I do. Yeah, two more. <laughs> yep. Uh, Levi Jaster, the uh, next one is 115 6 which is our deer management unit boundaries. Uh, I have a slide coming up. Uh, this change is at the very end of this regulation. It's the Kansas City uh, Urban Unit uh, number 19 that uh, basically also goes along the uh, I-70 corridor. Uh, this uh, unit was put in place to help with uh, population management and help reduce uh, roadkill potential in that area. The original boundaries on this slide are the red lines. And then the proposed change are the black lines. Uh, the big change was to move the boundary south uh, to include the lower half of deer management unit 10 within this so we didn't have that little triangle of only one uh, antlerless whitetail permit available surrounded by uh, units that allow up to five to be used um, and then uh, additionally to uh, use some more major roads on the north side to clean up the confusing boundary on the south and also, you know, prevent that same uh, issue of having uh, areas that were uh, fairly surrounded hey. by the, uh, five doe permits. <clears throat> so, uh, and these were, these boundaries were set on the uh, biologist recommendations from that area. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. From the looks of the, uh, Commissioner Lauber, from the looks of the map, uh, above the black line is still Unit 10. Correct, Levi Jaster, correct. It would be still Unit 10. Um, we don't want to make changes entirely to Unit 10 as far as the antlers permits because North of that black line, uh, we're still recording uh, deer populations that are uh, lower than uh, what we'd like to see. Uh, and we get quite a few comments from hunters up in that area about not seeing as many deer as they'd like. So we'd like to keep that uh, a reduced down to one antlerless permit up there. But then this gives us the flexibility to open up some of this that uh, does have uh, higher population Right. Yep. Simplify it for the hunters. Is there any discussion from the commission? Any questions for Levi? Can I have a motion? I move to approve. Commissioner Cross. A second. Good feller been moved and seconded, Commissioner, Commissioner Lauber, it's been moved and seconded that uh, we approve this change. Is there any discussion? Sheila? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Phil? Yes. Commissioner Spears? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Lauber. Yes. Seven zero. All right, Levi, you've got one more. One more. Um, Levi Jaster, uh, this is the Deer 25 series regulations that set our uh, statewide seasons and allow for uh, antlers, uh, the number of antlers permits in each unit. And so we're sticking with our uh, tradition overall, other than we are providing uh, a little bit longer than 
uh, normal extended antler season. Um, we've had some issues with short numbers of days the last couple of years and people that you know requested that they get more have more opportunity to take antlerless deer. Um, so it expands that. And then we're also in adding the uh, Elk City and the Barents Dick Wildlife Areas. Uh, Barents Dick is also known as Buffalo Ranch uh, to the list of our state properties that allow more than one uh, whitetail antlerless permit to be used on them due to uh, Complaints from our neighbors down there. Uh, flooding really pushed a lot of deer off of that area. And uh, so to help with that and reduce damage, we're gonna add that and we'll keep a close eye on uh, deer populations in those areas as we uh, go forward with this. Um, so the archery season dates for statewide for the state will be September 14th through December 31st. And the uh, urban antlerless only whitetail archery season will be January 25th and extended through January 31st. Firearm season uh, will start the traditional uh, Wednesday after Thanksgiving on December 2nd and run through December 13th. The pre rut uh, antlerless season will be October 10th through October 12th, which is the Columbus Day weekend. The muzzleloader season will be September 14th through September 27th. Um, the season for designated person or the use or disabled season, it's also called in September 5th through September 13th. And then the units uh, the extended firearm season in January for units 6, 8, 9, 10, and 17 uh, will be open from January 1st through January 10th. And the uh, units 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 11, 14, and 16 will be open from January 1st through January 17th. And then uh, units 10A. Uh, which would, and the 12, 13, 15, and 19 will be open from January 1st through January 24th. And uh, unit 18 has, will have no January uh, season and will not have any uh, antlerless permits uh, allocated in it. And with that, uh, that would be the differences in this or this proposed seasons. And I'll stand for questions. Are there any questions for Levi? Levi, uh, Levi, um, this, do you have any information right now as to where we are on? non-resident applications do you have any of that or is that I, I don't have any of that that's I don't handle that um so I don't I don't know how many we've had this year okay but but Mr. Chair we have been tracking that this is Brad Lovell's secretary um Doug or Mike I know you've been reviewing numbers recently about where we're with the non-resident applications do you want to share that I see Doug's muted, so I, I guess I'll I'll talk. We have we have been following that, and we have been ahead of last year um, throughout the whole process. I don't know, Doug. Have you looked at it to like in the last day or so? Uh, no, about two days ago, we were about 500 applications ahead of the same time period last year. Uh, the big the big push is right the last few days, though, and that's when we'll really know where we're at because a large portion of them are uh, sold in about the last four or five days. Thank you, Commissioner Ryder. Commissioner Lover, at one point in time, we had discussed, and it's not here, and I don't know if we necessarily need to deal with it today, but we had discussed if a non-resident was successful in a draw, that he would be able to buy an antlerless 
permit and still come to Kansas. Uh, I don't know, I'm not proposing that we adjust that at this time, but I would like to have that considered between now and next year. Somehow I have a feeling that the COVID-19 is going to reduce the number of applicants coming to Kansas. Uh, but I don't know that for sure. So could I have somebody at least have staff review that between now and next year? Sure. Chair, Chairman Lauber, this is Secretary Loveless. Uh, we'll be glad to do that, do a review and report back to you. What I would tell you in terms of the feedback I received, I know at that IOLA meeting, we had a constituent who voiced that they thought that would be well, a well-used option by non-residents who weren't successful in getting an either or tag. Um, subsequent to that, I've talked to a few outfitters who were very skeptical of that. They said, in their opinion, and these were outfitters who, who market largely to non-residents, their opinion was that uh, in the past, uh, those uh, permits were generally misused uh, and were used fraudulently. So they were pretty skeptical that, uh, that there was a significant number of non-residents who would travel to Kansas to take a, a non-antler deer. Uh, they thought it would likely be uh, a cover for them to try to take a, an antler deer. So that was just their opinion. So I've, I've received input on both sides at this point, but uh, as our staff will be glad to review that and report back to you. Go ahead and review it because we told one proponent uh, that we would, and I know the proponent very well. Uh, so, well, it has not been brought back up to me, but uh, it would be only in those situations that uh, uh, they would be unsuccessful in a draw. But then I'm kind of surprised that outfitters would take that position. Usually they can't have enough non-residents yeah. staying in their overpriced bunkhouse. But uh, anyway, maybe it's not a good idea. What, this is uh, Secretary Lovelace. We promised to get back to you on that. Well, yeah, Levi, Chairman Lover, Levi Jaster, this uh, currently, as I understand it, um, they could purchase a antlerless whitetail permit in January after the uh, antler se seasons allowing take of antler deer are over. Um, although Chris could correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, so there's opportunity for that. And I will look at those numbers to see how many people do that. Um, okay. Uh, did we have a motion on the table on this? No, we do not. Okay. If there's no more discussion, in general discussion, could I have a motion that we approve 115.25.9? Chairman, this is Hazlett. I move we approve as presented. Commissioner Ryder, second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion? Okay, can I, uh, if there's no discussion, Sheila, can you call the roll? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner DePeller? Yes. Commissioner Hazlett? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? Yes. Commissioner Spore? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. At 7 0. Okay, that concludes all the agenda that we have. Is there any uh, questions from the public, Nadia, that uh, called in during the meeting? Nadia Reimer, Chief of Public Affairs. Um, I haven't been handling the phone calls, just manning the chat room, and we did not have any public comment that needs to be shared. Okay. Uh, moving on, we have the next meeting scheduled for Jan or June 25th. Uh, it is our hope that we'll be able to go to New Strawn. It only remains to be seen as to whether we can pull that off. Uh, so I think stay tuned. 
Um, I believe that this particular meeting, although we didn't have a lot of public involvement, I think this particular meeting went off pretty well. I hope Sheila will have no difficulty in handling the minutes. Uh, I don't know if there's any other comments from Secretary Loveless, uh, Legal Counsel Thomason. If not, we're getting close to adjournment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Lauber. This is Secretary Loveless. No further comments from me. Christopher, you have anything? We have uh, June set in August. We have not set September and November. I would suggest if we're going to set September, it'd be the 17th or the 24th. I would prefer the 24th just out of sheer personal opinion and agenda, but I can be flexible on that. I think September 24th, does anybody have a problem with September 24th? Good day. Okay. And we need a location, I would suggest. Well, I don't have a suggestion for that, I guess. What is there? A place that anybody would prefer, Sheila. Do you have a rotation? Uh, I had. I don't think we've been. Well, we were in Scott City, I guess, not too long ago. I was thinking Southwest, but maybe we were in Oakley. Um, I can't think of any place we haven't been. We've done a fairly good rotation lately, so I think it doesn't. We, did, we didn't go to Topeka this year. We want to do it there. We can. That sounds good. I mean, yeah, if somebody else has another thought, that's fine, but. That was September. September 24th. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, Chris Timeson again. Then I, I would suggest we also set November. I'm gonna suggest the 19th and then suggest in the Northwest. Uh, that's the day before the governor's hunt kicks off. Does anybody have a uh, recommendation as to location? Well, we were at Kobe two years ago and then Scott City this past year. So I wanna go back to Oakley. Or we haven't been to Atwood in a while. Is that getting too far away? Oakley or Oakley or Atwood would be fine. Respectfully, I think Oakley might be just a little closer. Okay. I'll look for something there. All right. Mr. Chairman, Mike Miller, Assistant Secretary. I had a phone call with um, Keith Houghton, Ringneck Ranch here a while back, and he wanted me to make sure everybody knew if we were still going to be able to meet at uh, uh, the Ringneck Ranch or that area for the August meeting that he, he could make rooms available for the night before and offer tours of the ranch and his facility the morning before our meeting, and was curious as to know what else the commission might be interested in learning about or hearing um, while they were there before the meeting started. So just to put a bug in everyone's ear about potential for that meeting. Okay, what's the date of that meeting? August 20. And the meeting itself is where? At Beloit. Okay. Well, we'll try to have some responses to him, maybe by the time we have June meeting. Yep. Okay. You know, one, one op, this is Commissioner Spore. One option would be uh, to tour Jamestown. Uh, after all their construction they've done is fairly interesting. And then also in that Tipton Beloit area, there's extensive uh, upland game 
bird breeding operations uh, that are fairly interesting. Uh, I don't know the number, but there's a tremendous amount of birds that are being raised in that area. Something maybe that Mike, you could look into. Yeah, this is Mike Miller, and that would be part of what Keith would offer. There at Tipton is one of the really big um, upland bird breeders that, that provide birds for Ringneck Ranch, and he he could arrange for tours of those hatcheries. Okay, is there any other business, it's Commissioner Lauber, is there any other business to come before the group today? This is Commissioner Spore. I wanted to back up on that possibly opening up out-of-state turkey sales again. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what the governor's thinking and what it would take to be able to, what would have to happen in order to be able to open up sales of out-of-state turkey permits? Um, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Secretary Loveless. So um, the, the basis of this was um, the concern about the, health and welfare of Kansans and uh, with non-residents potentially bringing in that virus. So I would believe that the basis for changing it back would have to be a relaxation in those concerns. And while um, this wasn't a, a scientific process, it was, there were a lot of comments and you all received a lot of those. Um, so I, I, I don't know that we would, uh, we, we will use science as we're coming out of this, uh, this emergency declaration. So we'll have uh, better data, but given the fact that uh, things are lagging in Western Kansas, right? The counties or some counties haven't had their first case yet. Um, even when Eastern Kansas may be saying it's time to start relaxing things, Western Kansas may feel like it's just just uh, coming on out there. So uh, a big difference from west to east. But what I guess I would say is, um, it, I'm, I'm sure the governor will want to base uh, a change back to, to relax the regulation uh, based on uh, the science and the risk that is apparently posed uh, to Kansans by those non-residents. So um, that's not very satisfactory. I know uh, it's some arm waving, but that's the same kind of logic that went into the the change to rescind those uh, issuance of those permits. There's a, this Commissioner Lauber, there's a lot of regional health departments that got drug into this. Right. And those regional health departments have web pages and their job is to worry about stuff. And uh, this was definitely worth worrying about. And I think they put enough pressure on the governor that I think she succumbed. She certainly didn't. Uh, Secretary Loveless and Miller, Mike Miller had a uh, good response that they were sending to people who were sending inquiries. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kind of got surprised. But I think the level of pressure was really hard, high on the governor by people who are in a position to understand safety whether or not it was rational in all cases or not. And I think it just was impossible for her to say no after a while. Yeah. I, Chairman, Chairman Lauber, I would add, I, I had a conversation during our break tonight with a, uh, an outfitter in North Central Kansas up by Delphus. And he talked about the impact on, on his operation by not having these non-resident turkey hunters in. So we're, we're sensitive to that. Uh, certainly, we uh, would love to uh, share those opportunities before the end of season if we could. Uh, but I guess uh, we, we can have an ongoing conversation. I'm glad to give you feedback on how the conversation progresses as, as we get into May. And, uh, and if you all are interested, we'll, we'll keep this conversation alive with the governor and see if science indicates that relaxation is a responsible step. And, uh, and then, what we'll need to do, I'm sure, because uh, to your point, medical professionals, particularly in North Central and Northwest Kansas for reaching out to us with their concern, we would probably wanna get feedback from them as well as outfitters like I talked to tonight about the, if there's a consensus out there that the danger is passed 
and we can let some of these folks back in to chase our birds and spend some money in Kansas. We get too far into May and the demand and the weather conditions and vegetation for spring turkey hunting becomes less desirable. And uh, I just, I wouldn't hold, if, if something comes up, Brad, do it. But if at this point, I wouldn't hold my breath. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is Secretary Lovelace. I uh, appreciate that latitude, but what we'll promise you that's on, that's the first item on my list as far as uh, things we need to discuss and respond back to you. That'll be an internal discussion as well as the discussion with the governor and her staff. And, uh, but we will keep you appraised at how that's going once we get uh, closer to uh, relaxation. Right now, she's stating that she's hoping that that can be done around uh, early May. And so uh, she will follow the science, but if she relax that, that, that's a logical question for us to ask if uh, we could relax our, uh, and, and start issuing those permits again. Okay. Uh, is there any more business tonight? I think we put in a pretty long day. This is one of the longest evening meetings we've had. So at this point, thank you all very much. And uh, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Everybody drive careful, right? Yeah. That's right. Keep, keep your hands I'm waiting all night for that, Mike. <laughs> I had to beat you to it. Oh, Miller's so clever. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.